Former first-round pick Jason Allison has all the skill in the world, possesses a towering 6'3 frame, and is coming off monstrous seasons in the OHL, scoring 2.5 points per game. He's been up and down to the minors and back to the London Knights, and despite his skill, has been a complete non-factor with the Capitals. His main problem? He can't skate. That's swatted out by Kelly Miller, and Allison now has a two-on-one with Housley. Allison in, alone. Allison waits. Moe finally comes out. Allison scores! You hear this critique about players like Jason Robertson or Mark Stone. They're skilled, but big and slow. That's true. Both guys are below average skaters. They're not big transition drivers, but they're always with the play. They're able to offset their lack of speed with their smarts and skill. Jason Allison isn't just a below average skater. He can barely skate at all. In juniors, even in the AHL, Allison has been able to use his skill and strength to offset the fact that he might as well not have skates on. But the pace of the NHL game has left him completely lost for his first three fractional seasons with the Capitals. At the end of the 1996 season, he has career totals of merely 33 games played, two goals, and four assists. In fact, in 1996, the Capitals sent the young center to skating classes in hopes of bringing his speed up closer to NHL levels. Early in the 96-97 season, it looked like the lessons had paid off. Allison racked up 5 goals and 10 points in the Capitals' first 10 games, including the world's slowest splitting the defense, and a 3-assist game to help Joe Juno lead the Caps past a struggling rival in the lemieux Yager francis Penguins. Little did Allison know that he had already scored his last goal as a Washington Capitol. Unfortunately, he still had 43 games left as a Washington Capitol before he would depart via trade. The next 43 games were dismal for Allison, with zero goals, 12 assists, and somehow only 49 shots. Three on one if they hurt. Juno to Allison. Tries to go back. One too many passes. Aside from two assists against Toronto, Allison's main reprieve from boredom and frustration was getting beaten up by Bruins tough guy Dean Malcock and being awarded his first fighting major. Man, I hope we don't see that guy again. Alright, the trade is finally in. Who's it to? Oh, come on. Allison was a part of a massive deal centered around the Bruins top player Adam Oates. The goal is relentless. Here, Adam Oates patrols the offensive zone, searching for loose rebounds. So we left you, huh? Not even a note. He sees an opening and makes his move. You want to talk about it? You know, people say I'm a good listener. <sighs> You're off sides. Wouldn't be the first time. Oates, along with past his prime but still effective Rick Tockett and workhorse starting goalie Bill Ranford, were sent to Washington in exchange for the struggling Allison, 22-year-old reigning Vezina winner Jim Carey, NCAA standout Anson Carter, and a third-round pick. Each of these three players sent to Boston played all of the team's final 19 games following the trade. Yes, that includes Carey, who took the net in every game, including three back-to-backs. Carey's quantity of play belied its quality, which was not good at all. In fact, the, again, 22-year-old Carey will only play 14 more games before his NHL career is over. Anson Carter was the opposite, netting 8 goals in his 19 games. Our friend Allison wasn't amazing, but he did score a few goals, which was an improvement. Playing alongside the speedy Carter helped Allison, and the pair were semi-frequent partners on scoring plays. Allison even picked up two assists in the season finale against Pittsburgh, one of them on a great setup to Anson Carter. Allison's first season with the Bruins ended with 12 points in 19 games, a far cry from the gruesome conclusion to his time with the Caps. In the 1997 offseason, the best thing was about to happen to Jason Allison's career, and it wasn't more skating classes. In fact, it didn't really have anything to do with him at all. First, the Bruins selected winger Sergei Samsonov in the 1997 draft. Samsonov was the opposite of Allison in two ways. He was only 5'8", diminutive for the era, and he could fly. Where he wasn't dissimilar from Allison was his tremendous skill set. The Bruins then trade their best remaining forward, Joseph Stumpel, and a few other pieces to the Kings for goalie Byron Defoe and Dmitry Kristich. Defoe will compete with Carey for the goaltending job, but it won't be much of a competition. 
Defoe will be the guy in Boston's net going forward. The more pertinent player to Allison is Kristich, another smart, skilled player. Allison is going to get a lot of runway in the coming season. With both Stumple and Oates gone, Allison is the de facto number one center, whether he's ready for it or not. He's joined down the middle by another huge forward, the man the Bruins took first overall in the 1997 draft, Joe Thornton. Axelson dropping it back, Thornton moving in, Thornton shot, SCORE! Joe Thornton's first in the National Hockey League! Allison is strong early in the season, putting up points with decent regularity, mainly getting assists, bearing all the makings of a solid 50 or 60 point player. Then they put him with Kristich and Samsonov. The two wingers make for terrific drivers, puck carriers, and four checkers for the slow moving Allison. The big man hits another gear. Allison is now able to do more than just pass, not that he's given that up. He has a monster stretch from February 28th to March 14th where he racks up 8 goals and 17 points in just 8 games. Once Allison is in the offensive zone, the line is unstoppable. His combination of size and skill allow him to carry defensemen in a backpack here in the heart of the clutch and grab era. The Bruins, after finishing in last place in 1997, actually make the playoffs in 1998 on the back of their top line, Ray Bork, and a breakout season from Defoe. The top three scoring forwards on this team are all the top line guys. Samsonov with 47 points, Chris Stitch with 66, and Allison far and away their leader with 83 points. The 8th overall pick, Samsonov, will win the Calder as Rookie of the Year. Too bad that Thornton kid couldn't get it figured out. 7 points in 55 games. Maybe he could learn a thing or two from our friend Jason. Pass to Jason Allison, goes to his backhand, goal scorer's goal, flips it up and over top of the blocker of Rick Tabaracci. There it is. Matched up against Allison's former team, the Bruins fell to the Capitals in 6 games and 5 overtimes. Allison led all players in points and all forwards in ice time. Throughout the series, he looked just as strong as the man for which he was traded. Ice time becomes a trend for Allison in the next season, and so does scoring, though Chris Ditch keeps up with him this time. Allison's average ice time of 22 minutes and 23 seconds per game is 10th in the league among forwards, putting him in a class with the very best of the best. The people ahead of him? Hall of Fame, Hall of Fame, Hall of Fame if he ever retires, Hall of Famer's line mate, Hall of Fame if he'd ever shut up, Hall of Fame, Hall of Fame, Hall of Fame, Hall of Fame, and Allison, who pairs his time on ice with 76 points. The Bruins have the same point total in 99 as they had in 98, sliding into the playoffs yet again. This time, they dispatch their first-round opponent, the Carolina Hurricanes, leaning, of course, on Ray Bork and the suddenly superstar-level Defoe. Defoe, the save, the rebound, denied by Defoe! Puppy! Oh, and Defoe again! Also, on their new 1-2 punch down the middle. Thornton, softly for Kristen, for Allison, SCORE! Allison and the emergent Joe Thornton clocked 26 and 22 minutes per game through the Carolina series, each clicking at a point per game rate. The two continued the trend through the first two games against Buffalo, but Thornton's minutes were cut into in Game 3 as Bruins coach Pat Burns tried desperately to play his nearly unplayable fourth line. In Game 4, Thornton loses an edge trying to avoid a check from Sabres forward Vaclav Verata and appears to get kicked in the face. That costs him most of the game. The Bruins leaned even harder on Allison late in the series, and I don't mean his line, I mean him. Allison logged 27 minutes in Game 4, which did not go to overtime, behind only Bork and his partner Kyle McLaren. The next person after Allison was Hal Gill at 19 minutes. Allison eclipses even McLaren in Game 6, but the Bruins fall to Hoshik's Sabres. The Bees have once again lost to the Stanley Cup runner-up. The next season sees Allison's running mate Dmitry Kristich shipped off to Toronto right after he won an arbitration hearing, pricing himself out of Boston. 
This trade will be a massive dud for the Leafs, with Sean McIndoe putting Kristich on his Toronto Nightmare team in 2008. Without Kristich, Allison is perfectly good, but more concerning is his wrist. Allison had a wrist sprain in the spring of 99 and fought through it, not really addressing it. This sprain became a massive cartilage tear and tendonitis that ran up his forearm. According to Allison, it was the motion of face-offs that worsened the injury. The injury was bad enough that a doctor recommended surgery in October. He played until January 8th, when a separate thumb injury ended his season. Just two days earlier, Allison had inked a new contract with the Bruins, so at least that was out of the way. His quote from an AP article describes the situation well. In a way, it could be a blessing in disguise, said Allison, whose left hand was in a cast. Instead of playing not even close to 100% and not playing very well, at least this way I know I will be 100% when I come back. For the Bruins, the 2000 season marked the end of an era as Captain Ray Bork was traded to the Avalanche to chase his Stanley Cup, while the Bruins sunk to a last place finish in the Northeast Division. This was now Allison and Thornton's team. When the Bruins stumbled out of the gate for the 2000-2001 season, leading to coach Pat Burns being shown the door, Mike Keenan took over and was looking to fill their captain vacancy soon after. His choice was obvious. Through 15 games, Allison had picked up 9 goals and 23 points. He would be the Bruins' newest captain. Shortly after, the Bruins get a new Christich, and frankly a better one, when they acquire Bill Guerin. The new top line of Allison, Guerin, and Samsonov is dominant. Allison leads the line racking up 95 points, a new career high, fourth in the league behind only Yager, Sakic, and Eliash. Guerin and Samsonov hit their own career highs. Joe Thornton joins the trio on the power play. He hit a career high in points and goals, and his line mate Brian Ralston hit, you guessed it, a career high in points. With all these leaps forward, led by a top five scorer, the Bruins reached 88 points? They missed the playoffs? Kyle McLaren couldn't fill Bork's shoes, and they suffered an injury to their number two guy. Darren Van Imp? What's Paul Coffey doing here? This is all to say the pretty gruesome defense is what kept this team out of the playoffs. Remember that extension Allison signed a while back? Well, that only covered this past season. Now Allison is locked in a contentious contract negotiation with the extremely frugal Bruins. The Bruins want to pay Allison $6 million a year for three years. Allison wants 8.5. The two sides draw no closer, and on opening night of the 2001-2002 season, the Bruins captain is absent, holding out for a better deal. Though nearly unheard of in the current NHL, save for a few exceptions, holdouts were much more common prior to the 2005 lockout and the advent of the current free agent system. Most players were only able to control their own destiny with unrestricted free agency after they were 31. The main negotiating tool players had was holding out, with players like Mike Pekka of the Sabres and Peter Nedved of the Penguins missing entire seasons. Even just on this Bruins team, Anson Carter had held out, resulting in the trade that brought in Guerin. All Allison can do is wait for a better contract offer, or hope for a trade. Nine games into the season, the Bruins, unwilling to pay Allison and seeing Thornton as the future, sent Allison to the Los Angeles Kings with Miko Alaranta for the significantly cheaper pair of Glenn Murray and Joseph Stumple. Stumple and Murray were great second-line guys, but L.A. had never been able to give their star winger, Ziggy Palfi, a genuine number one center to work with. With the departure of franchise cornerstone Luke Robitaille, who had offset the Kings' weakness at center playing the wing opposite Palfi, L.A. needed to get a new line mate for their best player. Allison immediately signed for just under $7 million per year in L.A. and was ready to hit the ice for the Kings' 10th game of the season against the Lightning. That was a loss, and it took a few games for the ball to get rolling for Allison in L.A., but it gradually started to click. The third man on the Kings' top line was arguably just as important as Palfi. Jason Allison hasn't magically gotten faster. He's a non-factor on the forecheck and is at his most valuable with the puck on his stick. Adam Deadmarsh is the opposite. Deadmarsh is a strong skater and a vicious forechecker. 
He thrives in the dirty areas of the ice, planting himself in front of the net and digging pucks out from down low. He rarely scores goals from range, but he'll rack up 29 alongside Allison and Palfy from right on top of the crease. A typical shift from this line, affectionately referred to as the LAPD line by fans, is a dig from Deadmarsh who shovels it to Allison, Allison draws attention to himself, passes to Palfy, and Palfy fires it on net where Deadmarsh has planted himself. The Kings were a defense-first squad that leaned heavily on their top line for any offense at all. Despite losing Palfy for the month of December to injury, the top line produces Palfy with 59 points, Deadmarsh with 62, and leading the team with 74 points in 73 games, Jason Allison. Los Angeles slinks their way into the playoffs. They put forth a valiant effort against a much stronger Avalanche team on the backs of great performances from Palfy, Allison, and goalie Felix Potvin, but Patrick Waugh is just too good, allowing only 13 goals across the seven-game series. An underwhelming end of the season, but there is still some hope for the future. They put together a great line and have some great young players. The Allison trade was a slam-dunk success. The next year, Allison hits the ground running, putting up 11 points in his first eight games, most of which are without Palfy, who's dinged up for the start of the season. In Game 9, the Red Hot Kings meet up against the miserable, winless Atlanta Thrashers. Midway through the first, Allison moves to avoid Thrashers defenseman Andy Sutton, who sticks out his knee into Allison. Allison's MCL is torn. He'll miss months. Sutton wasn't what you'd call a clean player, so to say his motivations were in question for many would be an understatement. Allison got off lightly compared to his linemate. Adam Deadmarsh, after putting up 13 goals in the Kings' first 20 games, is concussed. No one knows it yet, but his career is over. Shockingly, Allison is back in the Kings' lineup only five and a half weeks later. He's never relied on his legs, so he's still an effective player, putting up solid numbers until he collides with Mike York of the Oilers, then misses a hit on Keith Carney, both of which hurt his neck. He plays for a few more games, assuming his injury is whiplash, but he doesn't feel, in the words of his coach Andy Murray to the LA Times, sharp. Being who he is, Allison soldiers on. When his neck injury was mixed with a hip injury after a January 25th game against the Devils, Allison is finally taken out of the lineup. As his neck injury morphed from just whiplash with an additional post-concussion syndrome diagnosis, Allison was finished for the year. Luke Robitaille, having won his cup in Detroit, returns in the offseason, but there won't be a new top line of Robitaille, Allison, and Palfi. Allison's concussion symptoms refuse to subside. He'll miss the entire next season. Palfy will join him with a concussion of his own midway through the season. The entire LAPD line was gone, and subsequently, each of their times in LA had come to an end. The lockout cost each of them yet another season. Following the work stoppage, Dead Marsh had officially retired. Ziggy Palfy signed with Pittsburgh to play alongside Sidney Crosby, where he produced well, but after more injuries, awful play by the Penguins, and personal struggles, Palfy retired from the NHL and returned to Slovakia. Now granted free agency, Jason Allison signed with his hometown team, the Toronto Maple Leafs. In Toronto, he and fellow injury-plagued centerman Eric Lindros would hope to serve as compliments to top guy Matt Sundin. Game 1 versus the Ottawa Senators is a landmark in NHL history, the league's first shootout. Allison will take the first attempt in Leafs history and... Allison, poke check by Hasek, and he is stopped. Ottawa leads 1-0 after one round. It's kind of tough to take a penalty shot when you're not moving very quickly. It doesn't make it very tough. On the... Oh man, Jason just can't move at all anymore. Between the hip and knee injuries, Allison's speed has fallen from one of the slowest players in the league to nearly unplayable. At 5-on-5, five five, Allison is mostly a non-factor for an already very slow Leafs team, but he can still cook on the power play. Luckily, since it's the 2005-2006 season, power plays are as frequent as ever thanks to new slash stronger enforced rules aimed at ending the clutch and grab era. Shot by Coverley, missed, rebound, score! Jason Allison is second of the game. Allison is also always willing to jump to the defense of teammates, as he does against Atlanta fighting Greg DeVries. 
Andy Sutton and Brian McKay come drawing in. He's hassled down. Now McKay grabs a hold of Sutton. Allison racks up a pretty solid 59 points through the Leafs' first 65 games, then tacks on an assist in Game 66 to make it around 60. In that same game, Allison jumps to the defense of a teammate yet again and finds himself fighting Matthew Dandino. Allison leaves the game. Afterward, it's determined he'll need surgery on his hand. Yet again, he is done for the year. Allison is only 30. The Leafs, seeing the growing emphasis on speed around the league, move on from Allison in the offseason. No other teams show much interest, and to be fair, Allison has little interest in returning, wanting to spend more time with his family that lives just north of Toronto. With the lack of options and personal need to take a step back and sort some things out, Allison elects not to play in the 06-07 season. In the 2007 offseason, Allison is recharged, ready to step into a strong free agent market as a valuable asset. In a quote to the Hockey News, I think I'm probably the lowest risk guy out there, said Allison. I'll be on a one-year deal for a lot less money than anybody who can score a point per game, and yet I've done it my whole career. He's not wrong. Since he broke out in 1997-98, Allison has 444 points in 447 games, and that is during the depths of the dead puck era. Top free agents Michael Nylander, Scott Gomez, and Chris Drury all have slightly more points during that same period, but each have played in significantly more games, and, as Allison stated, he'll be significantly cheaper. Each of those players sign. Allison waits at home, but the phone never rings teams can't get over his lack of speed. Another season lost, then another in 2008-2009. All signs point to Jason Allison's career being over. But in September of 2009, the directionless post-Sundean Maple Leafs get back in contact with Allison. The now 34-year-old center will try out for Toronto, hoping to come back after playing in just one of the last six years. Allison isn't expected to make the team, but in his words to the Hockey News, he isn't a charity case. He plays a lot in the preseason, he rips Daryl Powell's helmet in half, but it just doesn't pan out. Allison is released from his tryout. His career is over. Allison was an artifact from another time, a type of player that just doesn't exist anymore. He had prime Joe Thornton skill with Florida Panthers Joe Thornton speed. Thornton won his MVP, will surely be headed to the Hall of Fame. Allison, once his captain, once the man pushing Thornton to the second line, is oft forgotten. Sometimes even reviled, finding himself on the same Sean McIndoe Nightmare Leafs list as Dimitri Christich. He was a casualty of injuries in the lockout. They cost the NHL a man who could have been, and for a little while was, one of the most unique stars the league had ever seen. Looked like the Panthers. Yeah, Steve Hines is taking all that abuse down in front. And he actually fell back on the skate of Roberto Luongo. So Jason Allison keeps it alive. The timing important. The Kings come right back with a strong shift. Palfi makes it work.